Hello, Mr. Fraser here. Uh, this is a video for the study of war photographer. Now, I'm making this primarily for my higher English class, but if you're studying this poem at National 5, what I cover here should still be helpful for you. So just a quick bit of context about this poem, War Photographer. It may feel like this poem sticks out a wee bit like a sore thumb compared to some of the other poems that you study by Carl Ann Duffy at National 5 and Higher English. Um, so a bit of context I think helps when we're approaching the understanding and analysing of this poem. It, just as the name would suggest, a war photographer is somebody who is deployed to war zones to document all the terrible, ter tragic, horrible things which happen there. Carol Ann Duffy was indeed friends with a war photographer and around the time that she wrote this poem and that directly influenced her um, construction of this poem. Now war photography may strike you as a very strange or absurd thing but it has existed for as long as photography has existed and certainly for as long as we've had photography available during wars. Um, this is one of the most uh, well-known examples of a photograph taken during a conflict. This was taken in 1972 during the uh, napalm attacks in the Vietnam Wars. Now, the image really speaks for itself. It's horrifying. These are children fleeing from the scene of a napalm burn and this girl that you see in the centre here, screaming, was very seriously burned. She survived. This is her today. And she has often been asked to speak about what her thoughts are on war photography and her accidental fame which came about as a result of this war photography. I'm not going to read this huge photograph, this huge quote I should say, uh, from this woman, but I would just um, draw your attention to this highlighted section. She says that we would not have war at all if everyone could learn how to live with true love, hope and forgiveness. If that little girl in the picture can do it, ask yourself, can you? Now what we can take from this is that this person, now a fully grown woman, who was documented in a photograph, sees the benefit of these photographs existing. She sees that it can do some good, it can hopefully allow for a better world. This is an interesting idea which Duffy explores quite a lot in her poem. However, despite the hopes of the woman photographed in the Vietnam War, it would be wrong to suggest that the existence of war photography is always successful in making us really care about the terrible things that happen in far off countries. And this is an idea which Duffy explores a lot in this poem. The fourth war photographer who we see here um, is very much frustrated at the fact that those around him in Britain don't seem to be appropriately moved by the horrible things which he is publishing or he is offering up for publication. So this idea of being desensitised to horrors of war is a, a, an important theme to this text. So let's start off with the first stanza. In his dark room he is finally alone, with spools of suffering set out in ordered rows. The only light is red and softly glows, as though this were a church and he a priest preparing to intone a mass. Belfast, Beirut, Phnom Penh, all flesh is grass. Before we jump into our analysis, just a, a quick bit of a, um, help with definitions. If you've never heard of what a spool is before, it's this kind of thing here. A spool is a cylinder which contains photographic film and it would be a common sight in the time that Duffy wrote this in the 1990s before the advent of digital photography on a, a mainstream level. So now I'd like to jump into analysis of the first stanza and before I go any further, just something which I like to say whenever I show an annotated poem or any kind of text really, is that remember that there is no such thing as a complete annotation. I will highlight things that maybe your teacher hasn't and vice versa. Your teacher, if it's not me, may have highlighted things which I've got here, which I've not got here, I should say, and that's okay. We, as teachers, might draw emphasis to different parts of the text. This video is a guide. It's an accompaniment to your studies. It's not to replace your in-class learning. So let's start off with the, uh, the first line here. In his dark room, he is finally alone. Now, already with the words dark and alone, you've got uh, words which are very much uh, associated with... Um, emotional darkness and isolation and you find that this idea of isolation constantly creeps up in this poem. He's a very lonely figure, the war photographer, despite the fact that in some circumstances he will be surrounded by a lot of people. Um, in his dark room he is finally alone. Notice the enjoyment here of the word alone. It's literally left on its own at the end of a line. Enjoyment is when the poet's sentence continues over multiple lines. And it's always interesting to see which word is left on its own halfway through a sentence. And in this case, it is the word alone, which is made to, in itself, feel alone. 
We can also read uh, metaphorically the word dark. It's not just the room which is dark physically and, and visually, but in a metaphorical sense, there's maybe a clue here that this is quite sinister, that perhaps what he's developing is something quite negative. I want to then highlight this use of the phrase ordered rows. So we talk about the spools of suffering being laid out in ordered rows. Um, now, first of all, a reminder that the spools is your photographic film, but that word choice suffering is very powerful. That lets it become very clear to the reader that these pictures contain negative, very traumatic images. They are spools of suffering. These are not happy holiday photographs. And if we got a clue to the nature of these photographs with the uses of the word dark and alone, creating quite a negative vibe, then that is very much confirmed with the spools of suffering. But then look at what he does with it. He sets them out in ordered rows. Now, some of us, when we read that line, we think of the fact that in a battlefield, when lots of soldiers have lost their lives, their bodies are laid out in ordered rows. If you go back and watch old war movies, you'll see this. Dead bodies laid in ordered rows for the purposes of identification. So Duffy's definitely doing something quite deliberately here. She's inviting you to think about that image. Even though it's the photographs that are going in ordered rows, that language is definitely going to recall the death and the horrors of the battle scene. We then have really interesting use of the word red here, and this works on two levels. It's visually descriptive because back in these days when there was not a great scale of digital photography, the photographer would have had to have sat in a dark room with a red light. That's how the photographs would have been developed. They would have been dipped in a solution, hung up to dry in a red light, and that develops the photograph. Now the word red here, much like when it's used in the first stanza of Caroline Duffy's other poem on the Scottish set text curriculum, originally, um, the word red here, yes, it describes the room, but in a metaphorical sense, this word choice here can be read for its connotations of fear, of um, danger, and I would say in this case, definitely violence, because this is a poem which only gets more violent as it goes along. Highlighted in the pinky sort of purple colour here is the lines and softly glows as though this were a church and he a priest preparing to intone a mass. This is a, a very, very interesting comparison. Uh, Duffy is using a simile. He, she is comparing the war photographer and his actions to that of a priest intoning a mass. And there's a few different ways that you can look at this. Um, for starters, much like a priest intoning a mass, uh, there's a sense of purpose to this. Uh, a priest will stand in a, in a sermon and, and will uh, talk to a mass and try to preach their message, their message of faith, and will try to persuade the people in the church to abide by that message. Similarly, the war photographer has a purpose. The war photographer is having the same determination as a priest because the war photographer hopes to persuade opinion with these photographs. So you do get a sense of determination with this idea of him being compared to a priest intoning a mass. I also think it's quite an intentional contrast that you're comparing religion, something which is supposed to embody good things. You know, faith to people is supposed to be something that brings comfort and joy and, and clarity in life. Uh, and you're comparing that to what we know are going to be horrible, violent photographs. We know that these are spools of suffering. We, we know from the colour red and the darkness that these are quite traumatic images. So you've got the positivity that faith is supposed to represent contrasted with the trauma. That's quite a sharp contrast. And in my mind, that really highlights the horrors of war even more when I read this poem. We then have a very um, blunt and punchy series of countries listed using very small sentences. Belfast, Beirut, Phnom Penh. Now here, Duffy could have chosen to just give us a traditional list with commas, but instead she's decided to punctuate these with full stops. Belfast, Beirut, Phnom Penh. It's a bit punchier, it has a lot more impact, and the reader is almost stop, invited to stop and reflect on the fact that these war zones are happening all over the world. So yes, in far off places like Beirut and Phnom Penh, but it's also quite close to home as well, such as with Belfast. So very sudden, very impactful, war happens everywhere. This then continues with the line, all flesh is grass. And that's quite a grotesque idea if you think about it. All flesh is grass. It's a metaphor. And if you think about this idea of grass and flesh being one, it might be inviting us to consider the fact that this is a gory scene. Perhaps there's been explosions and there are literally flesh and body parts scattered across everywhere, becoming one with the grass. 
But this metaphor is also a biblical reference, so it continues this religious idea which was established in these earlier lines. This metaphor is actually a quote which appears twice in the Bible. I've given the references there. It's usually taken to mean that all men are mortal. And here it describes the images being developed, and they are very uh, morbid and uh, gruesome. The flesh is spread over and is now almost part of the grass. So lots of interesting ideas here. The horrors of war is very much confirmed with this idea that there's flesh everywhere and it's part of the grass. But there's also this idea of a cycle, this idea of inevitable mortality, which comes with the biblical references. Moving on to the second stanza, he has a job to do. Solutions slop in trays beneath his hands, which did not tremble then, though seem to now. Rule England. Home again, to ordinary pain which simple weather can dispel, to fields which don't explode beneath the feet of running children in a nightmare heat. So we kick this second stanza off with a very blunt short sentence, he has a job to do. And if we got a sense from that previous stanza with the religious comparison to a priest that this is a man of purpose, well it's very much confirmed here folks, he has a job to do, he's determined. It's not oh, he might get this done if he has enough time, or ah, he's going to get this done and then have a nice wee break. It's no, I'm doing this now. He has a job to do. Very blunt, very important to understanding the war photographer as a character. We then get this interesting wordplay with solutions slop in trays. I love this line, solutions which slop in trays. Now remember in this previous section, we've just heard that he's a man of purpose. He has a job to do. He's trying to fix a problem. He's trying to do something about all the war in this world. He's looking for a solution. But of course, the use of the word solution is a bit of a double meaning here because it's describing both the literal solution, the fluid with which he is developing the photographs in his dark and lonely room, but those pictures are themselves the solution. He's hoping that by showing these disgusting, morbid, violent images that people are going to be shocked enough to care, shocked enough to want to do something about the terrible atrocities that happen across the world. And I often like the alliteration or the sibilance here of solutions slopping in trays. It always makes me think of the sound of the water swishing and sloshing as he's developing the images. Beneath his hands which did not tremble then, though seem to now. Beneath his hands which did not tremble then. Well, just look at that word choice of tremble. This tells us clearly that he is traumatised. He's traumatised and it's only maybe really hitting him now as he's being forced to recall these images and where he took them. And this is an idea which gets developed further on in the poem for sure. But we now get to see the sense that this guy is not a robot. He's not this mechanical machine that can just develop the photographs and not be affected by it. If he didn't feel any shock and trauma at the time, now that he's being asked to recall it, he's certainly feeling it now. His hands are trembling as he's doing it, suggesting trauma. Rural England. Now doesn't that make you think of that first stanza? Beirut, Belfast, Phnom Penh. We have here yet another location described in a short and punchy sentence. But it's not a war zone. It's jolly old rural England. And look at the, def- the, the detail there with the word rural. The rural makes me think of fields and farms and cows grazing and deers hopping over leaves. This lovely uh, idyllic image. What a sharp contrast to the war zones of Beirut, Belfast and Phnom Penh. That's an interesting contrast. And if you're analysing that line, I think it would always help to be mindful of what came before. Don't just analyse rural England, but compare it to the fact that we've already had short sentences used to describe war zones. That creates a very interesting contrast. Home again to ordinary pain, which simple weather can dispel, to fields which don't explode beneath the feet of running children in a nightmare heat. So much you can say about these lines. Talk about contrast. We hear about the fact that simple weather can dispel. That's getting at the idea that in Britain, Our problems aren't really problems. We moan about the weather. We moan about this, that and the other. But elsewhere in the world, children are literally dying. And Duffy's inviting us to consider that contrast in problems. But speaking of contrast, just look at this line here. Running children in a nightmare heat. Running children in a nightmare heat. If you isolate those phrases, well, running children is supposed to be a lovely thing. You think of running children and you think playing, having a bit of fun, mucking around. But then you put it into the context. These kids are not running because they're having a blast. These kids are running because they're in a nightmare heat, perhaps suffering from a napalm explosion, like we saw before with the images which I showed at the beginning of this video. So there's lots of powerful word choice here with exploding and nightmare heat. 
and there's a lot of contrast at play as well. All of this is establishing war as a horrific thing, not something to be glorified, not something to be indifferent to, but something to be horrible. Duffy is taking you through the experiences of the war photographer and this very much continues in the next stanza. Stanza three. Something is happening. A stranger's features faintly start to twist before his eyes, a half-formed ghost. He remembers the cries of this man's wife, how he sought approval without words to do what someone must, and how the blood stained into foreign dust. Again, another stanza with so much that we can say about it. Now we kick off with this short sentence, something is happening. It's almost as if Duffy's trying to grab your attention. She's saying, look, look over here, something's happening. A short and punchy sentence to grab your attention as a reader. A stranger's features faintly start to twist before his eyes, a half-formed ghost. Now again, we have something which works on a metaphorical as well as a literal level here. Because what is literally being described is the picture slowly developing. Remember, this is before digital photography. Maybe you've used a Polaroid camera. You'll know that the image slowly develops. Well, it's the same idea here. He's taken these pictures a long time ago and only now that he's dipping these pictures in the solution can he slowly see the image that he took slowly come to appear in front of him. And look at the language here. A stranger's features faintly start to twist. That word choice of twist is quite interesting because it could literally describe the twisted way in which the image is slowly appearing. But it could also be alluding to the idea that perhaps this is a person with twisted features, perhaps because of some sort of violent and gruesome injury. This idea then continues when the soldier pictured is considered to be a half-formed ghost. Now, again, that could be half-formed because the picture is only half-developed. But this person could also be half-formed in a very literal sense. There could be a very violent and gruesome imagery here. These suggestions are important for what comes next. And also, this idea of ghost. This could be a dead soldier, another horrific casualty in the war. But the ghost always makes me think of the idea of trauma as well. It's not just a ghost in the sense that this is a dead man that's potentially being photographed, but it's also this idea that his death and that image and this experience, like a ghost, is still haunting the war photographer. And for further evidence of that, think back to the previous stanza when we learned about the fact that he's trembling whilst developing these photographs. He can't escape the trauma. He remembers the cries of this man's wife. Look at the enjoyment there again. That word choice of cries is always quite powerful because um, that is often associated with grief and, and with trauma. But enjoyment invites us to have a bit of time to consider the word that's there at the end of the line. It adds emphasis to it. So we've almost left with these cries ringing out at the end of the line. Now this enjoyment with this emotional reaction is important. Remember this before we move on to the next stanza. Of this man's wife, how he sought approval without words to do what someone must. So the war photographer has sought permission, non-verbally, because he can't speak the language, to take a picture of this woman's dead husband. But just think about that. A woman's lost her husband in a violent and gruesome imagery. And we know, we, we know that this is possibly a violent and gruesome image, uh, injury, I should say, because of the language I've discussed here. She's just lost possibly the love of her life. And here comes the war photographer in a non-verbal way saying, can I just take a wee picture, is that all right? Because that's the role of a war photographer, is to stay impartial and to not be emotional and not be um, affected by what's in front of them. He knows that this is a terrible thing that he's seeing, but this is his duty. He's doing what someone must. There's that sense of purpose again that the war photographer has. And then we learn about how the blood stained into foreign dust. And this I often link back to the line from before, all flesh is grass, because again, we have this idea of, of human flesh and blood mingling with the earth and becoming one with the earth, suggesting a very violent and gruesome scene. But this is again, a biblical reference, which I've annotated here and I've got more information here. So if you want, feel free to pause the video and give this a read. And it's a very interesting way of looking at this poem, this idea of contrasting the ideas of religion with the ideas of mortality and death. Final stanza. A hundred agonies in black and white from which his editor will pick out five or six for Sunday supplement. The reader's eyeballs prick with tears between the bath and pre-lunch beers from the airplane he stares impassively at where he earns his living and they do not care. Again, another stanza so full of ideas that we can discuss. This idea of a hundred agonies, well, there's some interesting word choice right there. 
It's not just the idea that it's agonies, which are obviously related to this idea of, of pain and great distress and, and grief and trauma, but it's a hundred agonies. And he's got so many of these photos. Now that number is important because it's very quickly contrasted. He's got all, over a hundred pictures, say, of terrible things like the scene we've just learned about in the previous stanza. But the editor will pick out five or six. Now that use of the word or is important. It's hesitant, it's unsure, it would suggest the editor isn't really that fussed. And that's important because we now know how traumatic this scene was for the war photographer. It's making him tremble when he recalls that moment that he took those pictures. And he's taken hundreds of them, a hundred agonies. Yeah, the editor of the newspaper is going to look at it and go, nah, I'll maybe put five or six in my newspaper at best. For Sunday's supplement, the reader's eyeballs prick with tears between the bath and pre-lunch beers. Now for this section of blue, I want you to think back to the previous stanza. And think back to the wife crying whilst the dead soldier was having his picture taken. In that stanza, we had an enjoyment of the word cries, which really highlighted and emphasised that emotional reaction. Something similar is happening here, but it's a very different emotional reaction. We learned how the eyeballs prick. Now, that use of the term prick makes me think of the scale of shame from originally. It's like a pinprick. It's small. It can be irritating and annoying, but it's not that bothersome, really. And this is the reaction to that horrific scene, which we know is making the war photographer tremble, which we know made the widowed woman feel so much grief that she was crying aloud. Here the enjoyment is emphasising the idea of the eyeballs pricking, but that's just telling us that the public aren't really fussed about this. They're not that moved. They might look at it and go, that's a bit of a shame, isn't that sad? But we'll just turn the page and move on to our pre-lunch beers and our baths. He stares impassively at where he earns his living and they do not care. The final lines. At this point, we're not sure if the war photographer is, is leaving the war zone or arriving, but we know he's flying over the war zone at this point. And what this simply does is reaffirm this idea of indifference. He goes through all this trauma, takes all these pictures. He's determined to get something done about this. He's determined to have an impact. But in his heart of hearts, he knows that despite all the trauma, despite all the terrible things that he experiences, we are going to be more fussed about our pre-lunch beers, our baths, complaining about the weather, that kind of stuff. Our eyeballs are going to prick, but we're not going to cry out like the widowed woman in the previous stanza. And that's it, folks. Um, hopefully that has been of some help to you. If you have any questions about that, or if you want to request a copy of my resources and my slides to help with your annotations, your teaching or your studying, uh, just give me an email. I'll be more than happy to help out. Thanks very much.